Would you join me in prayer, please? Father God, you are so great. I thank you so much, Lord, for the ways that you take care of us, the ways you look after us. Lord, we're in this message of grace, and as we study your word about grace, there's a common theme. You provide for your people. You love your people. And at some point, they turn on you. At some point, they forget how great you are. At some point, they start to worship other things. And Lord, that's not okay with you. It's not okay when your people turn their backs on you. But Lord, we thank you for grace that invites us to turn back, that invites us to to give up our false worship and to realign ourselves with you. So Lord, my prayer is, as we come before your word today, that you would use it with power, that you would help us to destroy the golden calves in our lives. Help us to stop worshiping false idols. Lord, help us to turn to you and trust you. Change our hearts. Renew our minds. And help us to be the people you've always planned and called us to be. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. We're continuing our series on grace. uh, And uh, if you're kind of new here this week, perhaps, we're into the third week of grace. Uh, We began two weeks ago... And I shared with you some things, and, and, and we're going to kind of go over some of that uh, as we get into our message for today. Uh, but one of the things that inspired this series on grace is that I hear people throwing out terms in a way that doesn't mean what the Bible says they mean. And that happens with everything. I mean, people throw out the word love. Well, what does love mean? What is love? You know, all you need is love, right? Right? Um, but what is that? And, and, and you know, people, uh, worldly people, they, they latch on to godly terms and they kind of redefine them. And they've done that with grace. They, 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 they've taken it and they've redefined it. We talked about how the, you know, it, it just, so oftentimes what we do with grace is we think that God doesn't care anymore. You know, since Jesus came and he died on the cross, before that, God was angry all the time. And then, then Jesus became the final sacrifice. And then suddenly God said, okay, all right, now I can relax. You guys do what you want. I'll be back later. That's not grace. Now, that is an abuse of grace. And sometimes we kind of think, oh, well, you know, God doesn't care. I'm cool. He loves me. You know, maybe we think that. And we have to understand and redefine what grace is so that we can have that healthy relationship with God. Now, the flip side to that is, is sometimes we are overburdened by our failures. And, and we, we, we know we've compromised in the past. And we think to ourselves, well, there's just no way. I, maybe God would kind of, maybe God would kind of let me in, but I'm never going to be, you know, I'm never going to be like that person over there because of what I've done. Well, if that's what you think, you don't understand grace either. So we're going through this series, we're redefining grace. Grace, by definition, is unmerited favor from God. You can't earn it. Okay, but that doesn't mean that you're not responsible to it. Okay, last week we began, so the first week we kind of defined, uh, we kind of defined what grace is. Last week we started, we're going to go working our way through scripture, looking at specific examples of grace. And last week we started with Adam and Eve. And we kind of we kind of uh, kind of unpacked that a little bit, and what we talked about was how in in original sin, man who was created by God for fellowship with God, they chose they made a decision to realign themselves with Satan. So so they the, here they were they were firmly on God's team. God created them. He loved them. He provided for them, and he had fellowship with them. Satan comes along and tempts them. And they decide, you know what, we're going to trust Satan. And we're going to kind of do what Satan wants us to do. Well, that was not cool with God. You see, and and one of the things we talked about, you know, the problem with sin, there are consequences for sin. There are consequences for our action. The consequence of sin, whether we realize it, know it, acknowledge it or not, 
is we are, di- we are aligning ourselves with Satan and we're losing our relationship with God. And every single person on earth, I don't care who they are, they are born with no knowledge of who God is. We don't know. And we can't figure it out ourselves. Now maybe somebody could teach it to us. Maybe we could go to church and, and maybe we could read the Bible or, or whatever it is. But the point is, if, if it were not for this, and if it were not for the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, and it weren't for the church, you would have been born with absolutely no clue who God is. And, and you, well, maybe he's the trees. Or, or maybe he's the moon. And you understand why people, they, they think, well, there's got to be a God. Somebody made all this. I don't know who he is, so let's worship this. Let's worship that. Let's worship this over here. And meanwhile, we don't know who God is. That's the human condition. Now, you, now what's crazy is we live in this culture where we have some exposure to who God is, but we really don't know. I talked about how the, the, three, the three C's of the, of the human condition we're carnal, which means we exist in the flesh. We, our spiritual side is dead. People can say, oh, well, I'm spiritual, but then why do you worship trees? It's because you're carnal, right? Why do you, or, or, you know, why do you, you know, it, it's this idea that there's, we're kind of rooted in the flesh. We're carnal. That's the first C. We're, we're corrupted, meaning that our thinking, we, we can't always trust our own thinking. So we kind of need somebody to reveal truth to us because we don't know. So we're carnal, we're corrupt, and we're condemned. See, Scripture tells us that's not okay. It's not okay. I always find it interesting, and I'll I'll let you in on a little secret. Please don't get mad at me. But sometimes, you know, when we sing a song like we sang, from the day you saved my soul, I'll sing, I'll dance, my heart will overflow. Sometimes it's kind of interesting to see how people sing those lyrics. We're talking about salvation from, from eternal condemnation. And, and do, do we know that? Do we understand that's the gospel? Do we understand that by nature, Steve Harima, he hit the ground running. He was self-centered, egocentric. He was carnal. He was corrupted and he was condemned. I was on a collision course with eternal hell till God's grace saved me. I mean, do we, do we know that? Or, or, or are, we, are we lost our relationship with God because we're so busy worshiping the things of the earth? See, sometimes what, what Scripture does is it brings us back to that place and it says, this is the truth. It's not what you necessarily you've made it. And it's hard. It's convicting. But that's the whole point. That's, you know... A, there, there's a theology, you know, I, I just want to tell you too, give you insights about pastor. Do you know why there's songs at the beginning of a service? Do you know theologically what the whole point of that is? The point is, is that it, it, it's by nature, by our, by our created nature, now we're born again through, through, the, through the gospel and through Jesus Christ, but by nature we've just spent all week worshiping things other than God. Not all the time. A lot of us do devotions. We read scripture and we, and we fight against that process. But you've been inundated and bombarded with, with things other than God all week long. You've been tempted, you've been challenged, you've been, there's been this, this, this attempt to lead you away from God all week long. Theologically, the songs that we sing before we come to the Word of God help get you recentered on God. They call the, they kind of break down the service order. It's called the approach, the word, the response. And, 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 and how many people here, you don't have to raise your hands, but think to yourselves, how many of you here in the period of three songs can actually feel something change in you or shift in you? So you come in here and you're like, ah, oh, kid, blah, 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 my, my spouse, blah, 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 blah. And then after three songs, you're like, okay, Lord. I'm not making this stuff up, you know. I mean, and that, nor am I an idiot to it either. John Calvin, who has many quotes, but one of the things that he, uh, one of his most famous quotes is that the human heart is an idol factory. We're constantly looking for something to worship 
instead of God. And see, grace gives us that freedom and that invitation to give up the false gods that we're worshiping and worship the true God. So today we're going to sh- see a, a, you know, as uh, we're going to see a, a, just a prime example of that in Scripture. We're going to be in Exodus 32. I want to give you a, some context before we get there because, you know, when, we, when you're in the Old Testament, it, it, uh, one of the biggest challenges of the Old Testament is, pe- is picking what to preach on because there's just so much, the Old Testament is so rich and it's so amazing. I mean, the whole Scripture is, but the, the stories in the Old Testament are just, they're so intriguing. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously I've put a team together that kind of helps plan the, the series. And when we put together this series on grace, we figured it was going to be 11 weeks, which is going to go until Advent. So, so it's going to go till the Sunday before Thanksgiving. And we wanted to split it up between Old Testament and New Testament stories of grace. Well, it's hard to pick. And so we, we skipped over a lot of stuff to go where we're going to today. Um, but, but I'm going to go over some of it because it's context for where we're going today. We are going to pick up in the book of Exodus after the Jews, the Israelites, left their slavery in Egypt. So a lot of things happened before then. So, so when we left with Adam and Eve, there's a whole lot of stuff that, that went on between Adam and Eve and where we are today. A couple things that I want to talk about because they're relevant to where we're going is that God, God, this whole process of grace, where God revealed himself to people, he invited them to him, this is going on throughout Scripture. Now, in the Old Testament, we have a little thing called the patriarchs, which are the early, the Genesis, the, the kind of the, the people that God started working through. Uh, and of course, he made a covenant with Abraham. Now, before that was you know Noah. So we have Noah, uh, th- this preceded, then we have Abraham, Uh, And then Abraham had a son named Isaac who had a son named Jacob. Now Jacob, uh, not going to go into too many details about Jacob, but Jacob had 12 sons, okay? (laughs) And if you've ever heard of the 12 tribes of Israel, every tribe is, is, is from one of his sons. And, and if you understand, uh, one of his sons name was Joseph. And when you hear the name Joseph, there's two Josephs really in Scripture. There's the, the stepfather of Jesus. And then there's Joseph early on, who's the son of Jacob. Now Joseph, uh, he was the favored son, right? And so he had, he had 11 brother, brothers who didn't really dig that. Uh, so they had a problem with Joseph. So they basically, they, 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 they got rid of him. They threw him into slavery. And he ended up in Egypt. And so by, by working with God and through divine providence, uh, not stuff I'm not going to go into great detail. If you want to read it, just Genesis, Exodus, it's all there. But the point is, is that Joseph became a powerful leader in Egypt. And eventually he was kind of in charge of all the resources of Egypt. Well, there was a famine and, and Jacob and his, bro- and his brothers, the brothers that sold him into slavery, had to come to Egypt because they were in desperate need. And we see this wonderful example of Joseph giving grace to his brothers. And he, and he utters that famous line, that which you meant for bad, God intended for good. Which is kind of this, this picture of what God is doing in his plan. So now, uh, Joseph and all his brothers and Jacob, they all are in Egypt. They all settle in Egypt. Well, generations after Jacob and his brothers passed away, there was a new, there was a new pharaoh, new leaders in Egypt. The, the, the Jews, the descendants of all these brothers, uh, you know, the descendants, the promised uh, uh, fruit of, of this nation of Israel, they just started to multiply and they were very prosperous. So the leaders of Egypt looked at these Jews and they said, you know what, they're, they're just like, becoming so prosperous and they're so fruitful that we better do something with them or else they're going to soon be leading us so they put them into slavery they put them into bondage and that's where moses comes in so now we have the jews in egypt in slavery in bondage and of course moses you know said let my people go right i woke up with that in my that song let my people go right 
that, that's Moses, okay? So we have all the plagues, and we have Moses, the interaction with Pharaoh. The last plague was Passover, okay? I'm going to make a lot of connections that are still going on today. So Passover was this, was this plague where God sent the angel of death. And he told the Israelites, kill a lamb, kill, a, kill a, 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 a lamb, take the blood, put it on your doorposts, and the angel of death will pass over. If there's no blood of the lamb on the doorpost, then the angel of death is going to kill the firstborn child. That's Passover. The angel of death passed over their homes because they were protected by the blood of the lamb. Might be a Jesus reference in there. We'll, we'll get to that. Okay? So, after, after this angel of death comes, Pharaoh looks at them and says, you know what, just get out of here. Just leave, you're free, go. So they go, they leave immediately. The, the scripture says they didn't even have time to put yeast in their bread. So that's why they have unleavened bread. So they had, because they had to go. And they also, God told them, oh, by the way, grab all the gold and all the money of the, of the Egyptians and take that for you, because I've got this land, this promised land, it, it, it just, it just vast resources, milk and honey, and I'm going to take you and I'm going to give you this land. So you're going to leave, take what you need, and we'll go. By day, God himself was leading them as a column of smoke, and by night, a pillar of fire. So he's leading them. We also know that they came to the Red Sea. Moses parted the Red Sea. They went through. The Egyptians at some point turned on them, started chasing them, and they got the Egyptian or the Israelites got through. The Egyptians were in the Red Sea, and the sea killed them all. Okay. But as they're going through this, as they're leaving Egypt. God's providing for them. Now, of course, they're complaining the whole time. They're griping. Three days after they get delivered from slavery, they're already complaining. They don't have anything to eat. You know, what are we going to eat? Estimated anywhere from half a million to, to a million. I think Scripture says 600,000 uh, people traveling. Uh, and, and so, right, we get to this point where we're about two months after Passover. So for two months, and, 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 and God's been giving them, he's been giving them manna, and he's been giving them quail, and he's been giving them water out of rocks for them to drink. He's, I mean, he's just been taking care of them. Uh, you know, I don't know what manna tastes like. Uh, you know, pick, pick your favorite food, whatever it might be. Uh, I always said that, you know, if I had to guess what manna tastes like, it probably tastes like uh, Girl Scout Samoa cookies. You know, it's one of those things when you first start eating it, it's like, oh man, that's so good. I love Girl Scout cookie season. But then, you know, after a while you're like, eh, yeah, you know, it just, it gets old. So they're, they're at this point. God's been taking care of them. They get to Mount Sinai. Two months later, they get to Mount Sinai. I'm going to say it was 50 days later, and I'll tell you why in a little bit. And Moses goes up to the top of Mount Sinai, and God gives him the law, the Ten Commandments. Okay, where we're, where we're going in, in chapter 32 is what happens when Moses goes up to the mountain. He's up in the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. While God is giving him the law and all these instructions for the nation of Israel. While he's up there, what, what do the Israelites do? We're going to talk about that. That's this, so here we are in chapter 32. We're in Exodus 32, starting with verse 1. We're going to pick it up from there. I'll unpack this as we go, but... A lot of it is, you know, we're going to go in big chunks here. So, verse 32, uh, verse one, or chapter 32, verse 1. When the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron. Aaron was Moses' brother, who was kind of like a priest. He was, kind of, he was, he was a leader. He, he worked very close to Moses. Uh, and it, they said, come on, they said, make us some gods, lowercase g, who can lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. Stop right there. Remember, they came from Egypt. Gentiles. And actually at that time, people had a very limited understanding of who God was. So they worshipped all kinds of false gods. They made up stuff. Now, you can make the argument that all false gods are demons. 
Remember the serpent and the one-third of the angels we talked about last week? They're deceivers. And they're constantly trying to get us to worship them. But what's weird about that is they don't come to you and say, hey, I'm a demon, worship me. They come to you masquerading as something that you like. Say, hey, worship me. And so the, the Jews, had, the Israelites, had just been delivered from Egypt where they saw, they saw all of the pagan, uh, the pagan idols, all of the false gods, and they saw false worship. And so that's what they knew, right? And, and so here they are, they're in this place. They, they've been delivered thus far. They haven't quite reached their destination, but they've gone far enough. God's been taking care of them, and now it's time to kind of revert back to what they know. And just, you know, as we, as we make modern connections, I see people do that all the time. It's amazing to me the number of times that I see people that get on fire for the Lord. Maybe they're in a hard spot in their life, and they're just, oh, God is so awesome. Fast forward a couple years. And they're going back to what they know. This still happens all the time. They haven't reached the promised land yet, but they're far enough. Let's just lean back on what we're comfortable with and, and what we know, and, and let's just worship some of the stuff we used to worship, right? And so uh, it goes on to say, um, so Aaron said, take the gold rings from the ears of your wives and sons and daughters and bring them to me. The same gold that God provided for them when they left Egypt. So the same, take, you know, what if he had said, why don't you take God's provision and bring it to me? And then he goes, all the people took the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. Then Aaron took the gold, melted it down, and molded it into the shape of a calf. When people saw it, they exclaimed, oh, Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of the lands of Egypt. I want to stop right there calf what's up with the calf what you know what is that well again they had idols and 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 one of the things that um we know through scripture by study of scripture is because we're carnal and corrupted we worship things of the world we worship creative things uh romans 1 says they, they worship creative things instead of worshiping the creator and so you know what does a calf represent it, it it represents fertility it represents uh you know um virility which was a big thing that people worshiped pagans worship that one of the greatest idols that that pagans worship is relations sexual relations and so you know this is a big piece and so th this is all tied into it so the shape of a calf and people are are, are, are excited verse 5 uh, Aaron saw how excited the people were so he built an altar in front of the calf and then he announced tomorrow will be a festival to the Lord so now he's calling this calf the Lord the people got up early the next morning to sacrifice you know I you know as I read that I was just it's amazing how dedicated people are to worshiping false gods. They wouldn't, you know, it's funny, people would do things for a false god they would never do for the God. They'll get up early. They'll travel a hundred miles to worship a false god. But they would never do that to worship God. Maybe they would. The resources, the energy, the time people dedicate to stuff that isn't even God. It, it, it blows your mind out. But see, they got up early the next day, sacrificed burnt, burnt offerings and peace offerings. After this, they celebrated with feasting, drinking, and they indulged in pagan revelry. What's pagan revelry? Well, if the calf is a god of fertility and a god of virility, what do you think they were doing? And I'm not going to go into it cause we have, for kids' sake. But the point is, this is what they were doing. Kind of sounds like a lot of major events that are out there, right? When I heard this, I remembered concerts that I used to go to. They were just like this. You know, I've even seen, you know, I've gone to football games. It kind of remind me of this. 
you know, we do this all the time. We go to places, and I, you know, you know me, I love football, right? I mean, I love these, it's not like those things in themselves are, by doing so, are bad. It's just that we tend to worship them. We tend to worship the people on the stage. We tend to worship the people on the field. We worship the event. And that's where we have to be careful. You just, you got to be mindful. What, what, is, what is this doing? And, and so, you know, here's the situation. This is what they're doing. They're worshiping, but they're not worshiping God. Verse 7, the Lord told Moses, quick, go down the mountain. Your people whom you brought from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. I want to stop. God says to Moses, you better get down there. Your people are making mistakes. It's like God has disowned them. They've, again, they, they've realigned themselves with Satan. And they've turned from God. And you kind of see this picture, this picture of what people do. And, and I'm convicted myself. You know, again, we go back to this whole idea of grace. Oh, you know what? It's not that big a deal. God's kind of relaxed a little bit. He's actually really cool and really happy. No, no, he hasn't changed. It is a big deal to God. When we turn our back on God, when we worship things other than God, it is a big deal to Him. And He just doesn't sit there and say, oh, those people of mine. It's a big deal. And just so we can all be honest right here, right now, we all do it all the time. Every one of us. We all do it. We all worship things other than God. And I'll give you a few false gods that we all worship. Number one on the list, money. Especially here in America. Money. We'll worship it. How about recreation and pleasure? Name your, you know, part, part of the application that we have here, what is your golden calf? We all have one. And we can all sit here and say, those stupid Israelites, what's their problem? They're just doing what we do what's your golden calf when you feel like god maybe perhaps isn't there or maybe things are good or whatever it is and you get kind of that place that lull what do you revert back to worshiping that's your golden calf we all have them part of my preparation for this message was time spent with God saying, God, what is my golden calf? What do I worship instead of you? Oh boy. We all do it. So here we go. God's upset. Uh, he goes, your people, how quickly they have turned away from the way I've commanded them to live. He's just given Moses the law. And in that law, it says, don't make any false idols. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. How quickly they've turned away from the way I commanded them to live. They have melted down gold, the gold I gave them, and made a calf. And they have bowed down and sacrificed to it. They are saying, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Then the Lord said, I have seen how stubborn and rebellious these people are. Now leave me alone so my fierce anger can blaze against them, and I will destroy them. Then I will make you, Moses, into a great nation. God's saying, you know what? I'm just going to get rid of them. They're going to worship false gods? Fine. They're going to turn away from me? Fine. I'll just get rid of them. It's not okay with God when we do this. You see, if you don't understand this, the reason why we have to go here is so you can understand the power of grace. We're going to get there. We're going to keep going there. But you've got to know, it's not okay with God. And if you hear one thing loud and clear, it's that when you leave here today and you begin to worship things other than God, God is not okay. It's not cool. But there's grace. And we'll talk about that. But let's, let's keep going. It's, it, so God's ready to, God is ready to, to basically destroy them and rebuild through Moses. 
Verse 11, But Moses tried to pacify the Lord his God. O Lord, he said, why are you so angry with your own people whom you brought from the land of Egypt with such great power and such a strong hand? I'm going to give you a clue on how to interpret Scripture and how to understand what's going on here. God is all-powerful, all-knowing, never-changing. Okay, we have to start theologically, the full counsel of God. Who is God? God's not sitting there. We, we kind of, in our minds, in our human minds, we kind of turn God into a person, and then we kind of have this picture of Moses sitting down with God and talking him into something. And God almost going, huh, I never really thought of that. You know what, Moses, that's a good idea. I mean, that's a, that doesn't, that's not God, right? So people are confused by these scriptures. What's going on here? But, but, but remember, so much of what God does, we talked about this last week, is he works through revelation and discovery. So it's almost like, so it's like God saying to Adam, Adam, where are you right now? And Adam says, I'm hiding from you, right? Do you think God didn't know Adam was hiding? But, but, he, but, it, but sometimes God throws something into us almost as if to say, where are you? And, 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 and discovery and realization. So God says, your people, but then Moses says, no, your people. This is a reminder to Moses who these people belong to. They don't belong to Moses. And, and oftentimes as a leader, you know, you know, we one of the things we like love to worship are leaders or uh, uh, celebrities. It's been interesting to watch the Pope come, right? You know, I know the Pope believes in Jesus. I know he's a good guy and he's got a good heart. But how many people out there are worshiping the Pope? It's just kind of weird. You watch it, but this is what people do with leaders, and and it's just it, you know celebrities. We want to worship people and put them up on this pedestal. But what a, what a leader is supposed to do is redirect them to God. Okay, they, 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 they make that connection to God. If, if sometimes, you know, just kind of an example, people come up to me and they say, wow, that was a great message. And I'll say, praise God. Because you think I'm doing this? People, you know, when you see things going on, it, you know, you praise God for it. You, you turn the praise to God. Moses is turning it to God. He says, your people. It says, uh, um, why are you so angry with your own people whom you brought from the land of Egypt with such great power and such strong hands? Why let the Egyptians say their God rescued them with the evil intention of slaughtering them in the mountains and the wiping them from the face of the earth? Turn away from your fierce anger. Change your mind about this terrible disaster you have threatened against your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says, Jacob. Jacob, if you know the story of Jacob... Jacob was renamed Israel because he fought with God. He wrestled with God. And Israel means God fights. So, God, or so Moses, he, he, he's going back through God's promises. God's promises. His faithfulness. His promises. Not because God's forgot about it. But because Moses needs to remember you need to remember God's promises. When you start to revert back and you start to think, oh, you know, it's just life will be better if I worship this golden calf. Remember God's promises. He hasn't changed. If you were on fire with God for God two years ago and now you're in a place where you're not so much, who's changed, God or you? If you're, if you're struggling in your faith, and you, you're just, you know, I just struggled connecting with God. Do you think he's changed? Or have you? But, but, but in that, how do you get back? You remember his promises. He's faithful. He's not going to change. It's not going to change. We keep going. It says, um, he goes, remember your servants Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You bound yourself with an oath to them, a covenant, saying, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in heaven, and I will give them all of this land that I have promised your descendants, and they will possess it forever. You promised God. You promised God. In verse 14, so the Lord changed his mind about the terrible disaster he had threatened to bring on his people. Did God change? 
Have you ever been there? This is kind of a leadership thing. Or somebody, you know, somebody has an idea that you're in agreement with. And, and, and you know, they, they kind of come to your way of thinking, but you let them think it was their idea. <laughs> right? Or is that just me? Maybe it's just me. But the, the point is, is that there's this, you know, God knew. God had a plan, and this is all part of the plan, and Moses is aligning himself with God's plan. And so when it says God changed his mind, God was angry. But he, and he, but he did honor Moses, but he never, he never turned on his, his ultimate intention. And so here we are, and you'll, as we keep going, verse 17, when Joshua heard the boisterous no, noise, oh, sorry, let's go back a little bit to verse 15. Then Moses turned and went down the mountain. He held in his hand the two stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant. They were inscribed on both sides, front and back. These tablets were God's work, meaning he wrote them. The words on them were written by God himself. Verse 17, when Joshua heard the boisterous noise of the people shouting below them, he exclaimed to Moses, it sounds like a war in the camp. But Moses replied, no, it's not a shout of victory, nor the wailing of defeat. I hear the sounds of celebration. Stop right there. I hear a rock concert. I hear a football game. I hear a celebrity and people adoring that celebrity. I hear a show. I, you know, think about all the things that that we can worship. I hear the sound of a celebration. When they came near the camp, Moses saw the calf and the dancing and other things, and he burned with anger. He threw the stone tablets to the ground, smashing them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf they had made, and he burned it, and then he ground it into powder, threw it in the water, and forced the people to drink it. Drink this. God offers you pure living water and you defile that, here, drink it. Finally, he turned to Aaron and demanded, what did these people do to you to make you bring such terrible sin upon them? Stop right there. In Deuteronomy, there's more information about everything that's going on here. God wanted to kill Aaron. Aaron was like the priest. He He was the leader while Moses was gone. And God said, you know what? Kill those people and kill Aaron. Kill them all. And so uh, this did not happen. But remember, we go back, we go back to the Garden of Eden. What, what, what are the consequences of sin? Shame and blame. Let's see how that plays out here, shall we? So, um, verse 22, Don't get upset, my Lord, Aaron replied. You yourself know how these evil people are. They said to me, make us gods who will lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. So I told them, whoever has gold jewelry, take it off. When they brought it to me, I simply threw it into the fire and out came this calf. (laughs) Shame and blame. Well, it can't be me. It's It's gotta be somebody else's fault. If you had done what you were supposed to do, then I wouldn't have done this. Shame and blame. Nobody ever really admits that they messed up. You want to feel the power of grace? Just own it. Say, you know what? I made a mistake. I'll never forget, as I thought about this, I was reminded of a story. Uh, When I was playing football, there was a play. It was a big game, a huge game. And uh, I I was actually injured but I was playing anyway. And I got pancake blocked on this play. I got pancake blocked. I remember this because it doesn't hap- didn't happen very often. And the running back went right through my hole and scored a touchdown. And I came off the field, and my coach, my animated defensive coordinator coach, comes up to me, Here, ma! You know, I'll, I'll, I'll spare you the, the adjectives that he used in the moment. Basically, I'll paraphrase. Why did that happen? I looked him straight in the eye and I said, you know what, coach? I screwed up. And you could just see he was like, uh, uh, don't do it again. <laughs> he was waiting for me to blame somebody else or something else. You know, have you ever, you ever done that with your kids? You catch them red-handed and you're like, why did you do that? They say, I messed up. 
as a parent, you're like, oh, well, well, don't do it again, you know? But if they start giving you excuses, well, it was their fault, it was their fault. Oh, boy, don't go down that road. But this is kind of, so, but, but Aaron, shame and blame. Verse 25, Moses saw that Aaron had let the people get completely out of control, much to the amusement of their enemies. So he stood at the entrance of the camp and shouted, all of you who are on the Lord's side, come here and join me. That's a big piece to it. He said, all of you who want to repent and realign yourself with God, come here. That's grace. So here's the grace. All you, come to me. And all of the Levites gathered around, and there was one particular tribe uh, that everybody in that tribe repented and came to Moses. Moses told them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, each of you take your swords, go back, not everybody repented, go back and forth from one end of the camp to the other, kill everyone, even your brothers, friends, and neighbors, the Levites obeyed Moses' command, and 3,000 people died that day. It's not okay with God. If you understand what grace is, you understand that grace frees you from the consequences of sin, not so that you can continue to sin, but so that you can repent and realign yourself with God. I want to, I want to tell you about a very, you know, we, we read that, and, and, and sometimes people, you know, they're convinced the Old Testament God is an angry God. Oh, there he is. There's the God that kills people. Right there, 3,000 of them, God killed. Moses said, all of you that want to return to the Lord, come join me. You see, you can't, grace does not free you to live a life where you worship, honor, and align yourself with Satan. It just doesn't do that. It's an invitation to align yourself with God and have a relationship with God. I, I, I think about this all the time, and, and I don't think we understand fully what salvation means. I was carnal. Steve Harriman hit the ground running years ago. I was living a self-centered, self-focused, egocentric life. It was just all about me. Carnal. Everything I could see and touch, all the desires, all those things in life. I was corrupted. You couldn't have walked up to me and told me I was wrong for all the money in China. I would have laughed at you. I used to argue with Christians all the time about why what they believed in was so ridiculous. If you know my story, you know that's how I was. I was carnal and I was corrupted. I didn't even know. I was condemned. I was going to hell. Until I was saved. See, I sing a song, from the day you saved my soul. I can't just sit back and say, oh, you know, what they do. That's a big deal. That's eternity. I was, I was going to, to a place. I was bound there. And I was determined. I had the heart to go there. I was, I, you know, obviously nobody wants to go to a place called hell. But I didn't want God. I didn't want heaven. I wanted everything that, that was in the world. I was totally into pop culture. I was driven by whatever I could see. And I just couldn't get enough of it but I was condemned. And God freed me. See, that, that's grace. God said, Steve, you can't do it on your own. You can't figure it out. You can't be good enough to earn my favor. So I am going to give you grace. Now come to me. And when I turned to God, my life changed. My heart changed. And see, this is is the power of grace. If you're out there preaching something else, if you tell people, oh, God just loves everybody, and, and you just live however you want to live, and, and, and you know, then you miss out on the power of grace. It's not true. It may make you feel better temporarily. It may kind of temporarily ease the shame consequence of sin. But there's no power to transform you. 
doesn't change your life. It doesn't change your heart. It doesn't change your thinking. It doesn't change your nature. I told you that this was probably, let me give you a little timeline here. 50 days after Passover, they went, I'm going to say 50 days, and I'll tell you why in just a minute. 50 days, Moses went up to Mount Sinai and he received the law. For 40 days and 40 nights, he's with God on the mountain. He comes down and all these things happen. Okay? Why 50 days? Let's fast forward 1,500 years. Passover. Jesus was crucified. 50 days later is a festival that's been going on ever since this when this happened, Exodus 32, there was a festival that happened with the Jews called the Festival of Pentecost. The Festival of Pentecost. When God poured out the Holy Spirit to all those who believed in Jesus Christ. Now I want to show you this. Let's jump ahead to Acts chapter 2. You want to see the power and the sovereignty of God? Let's jump ahead to Acts chapter 2. I want to show you something that is so cool. Verse 36 Peter, the Holy Spirit's been poured out on the church. Peter is talking, he's witnessing, he's filled with the Holy Spirit, and these are his words. So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. Peter's words pierced their hearts, and they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins, turn to God, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, to your children, and even to the Gentiles, all who have been called by the Lord our God. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time. Remember this verse, if you think I'm going too long. Strongly urging all of his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to church that day. How many? How many were killed? How many were saved? Glory to God. Isn't that cool? You know, these things are not coincidence. This is God yelling and shouting, this is true. I've been doing it for years and years and years and years and for years people have been turning away from me, worshiping false idols. For years I've been saying, come to me, here's grace. Come to me. Trust me. Here's grace. I'm here to save you. Are you going to worship him or a golden calf? What are you going to do? Can I tell you how I battle the golden calves in my life? I thank God for them. I say, you know what? I, I do things, the way that I keep from worshiping things, is I always put God ahead of him. I always put God before him. And if God wants me to compromise on my relationship, if, if this, these things want me to compromise on my relationship with God, I will not do it. There is no recreation. There is no event. There is no program, no concert, no anything that's going to drag me away from worshiping the Lord ever in my life. I made that decision for me years ago. Years ago. And I'm telling you, it is a constant battle. Doesn't mean that I don't fail sometimes. Doesn't mean that my worship is always perfect and good. But I'm there. And I'm committed to God. And everything that I have in my life, I keep reminding myself, is His. It's His. May I never worship. May I never, may I never ever forget that it's His. John Ortberg wrote this great book. It's called, it, it, it All Goes Back in the Box. And it's this picture of a funeral. And in this funeral, I picture myself someday at my funeral. And I, I have nothing in the world with me. Wherever I'm at in that moment, nothing on this world, nothing that I've strived for or worshipped or worked hard to get, nothing in that moment is with me. All I have is Jesus. 
I, I, I don't want to be in that place. And, and, and say, you know what, Jesus? I, I wanted to worship all this other stuff. I actually want this other stuff more than I want you. You've got you to gotta fight it. You've got to battle it. You've got you to gotta, you gotta constantly work on God. You have to know that by your nature, your default position is to worship other things. But always remember, grace is there inviting you back. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for your grace. And as we read your word, we study your word, we confess the golden calves in our lives. I pray, Lord, over the, the, the next several days, maybe even during this time of worship, that you would reveal to us our golden calves, not so that we can run away and hide and feel ashamed, because when we confess them to you and we repent, Lord, your grace sets us free. So, Lord God, set us free. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your sacrifice. And we worship you because you alone are worthy of our praise. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. You know, the human tendency is to minimize what something means. For whatever reason, we just kind of shy away from the truth so often. And we try, well, let's make it a little less offensive. But the truth is, is we understand grace. It's way better and more powerful than, than we minimize it to be. I mean, grace is this amazing, powerful thing. I see the effect it has on people. There's nothing better on earth than to witness a person who is saved by grace. I didn't get to see it when it happened to me. I experienced it from within. But when you see the way that people are changed and set free, it's the greatest thing there is. And we talk about that pillar, those pillars in, the, in that building that symbolizes uh, what the gospel message is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. To God be the glory. It's an amazing thing. So I, I, I want to bless you as you leave here. Please stand, receive this blessing. As you go out today, and as you fight, quite frankly, the world's attempt to get you to worship anything but God. I pray and I bless you that you would leave here now knowing the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the Son, and the fellowship and the power of the Holy Spirit now and always. God bless you. You're dismissed. Have a great week.